everybody. Today I have with me best-selling author Owen Dempsey. Oh, well, that's me. Oh, it is that's, Owen. Yes, that is correct. Right. And Owen Not wrote showing this. Not showing our or Ian. Ian Owen. Owen. But you fact. like Owen. It's not a it's out there, yeah. <laughs> and he wrote this book. amazing book, Finding Rebecca. Thank you very much. It is. I cannot say, and I wish I could. I wish I could stand up and just bow down to you. this book. <laughs> I am not even kidding. And I, read, well, I you can do that if you want. Oh I don't. Gosh. I'm telling you, I read books all the time, and I started this book, and you know, because I'm always reading and and you know, like always reading for ahead. I could not put. I was like, okay, I'll read a chapter of this, and then something else. I could not put this book down. Okay. I cannot oh, yeah. put it down. It is that good. And this story is amazing. And I love historical fiction. So it, it is right up my alley for, you know, but it is one of the best historical fiction books, I have to say. And for, I, I'm a homeschooling mom, okay? And for all my homeschooling moms who are listening to this out there, if you are trying to teach your children about World War II, th this should be on their list, this book should be on their list because even you know I love teaching kids through historical fiction and I don't know if you ever thought of that because your son is younger but it is a great way to teach our children about history well I am a teacher so oh you are a teacher okay yeah but I don't teach history or I should have taught history in English something like that but um, I only became a teacher when I was in my early 30s and uh I um, had a business degree, which was a very poor decision I made when I was 17 to go to college to study business, as anyone who knew me at the time would attest to. And I, I came out, I didn't want to give up. I'm not really the quitting type, I suppose. So I just went, got, went through it and I got my degree, and then I wasted my time for a few years doing that kind of jobs. And uh, I came, I moved to the States when I was 31 with my wife, who's American, that's why I live here. Mm -hmm. And. Um, yeah, I wanted to become a teacher, and yeah, I, I had a choice. I could either be a business computer teacher with my degree, or I could go back and do four years of school, and that's no choice at all. So hence, I'm a computer teacher, nice. and have been for seven years now. So that's what you do when you're not writing awesome books. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I do, yeah. <laughs> okay, what I love, and then uh, the part that I love about this book is that you are a man, and you're writing this love story, Okay, mm -hmm. and it is like I love the two of them together, you know, and and you had me going because as the book goes on, it's like, are they going to be together? No, they're not going to. Yeah, they are. Okay, no. <laughs> like they had so much working against them that I was convinced they would never figure out how to be together. And and I I'm, loved. I was convinced they weren't going to be together too. <laughs> oh, really? Did, did you did you? plan it or did it kind of write itself like as you were both. writing it both both yeah I, I the way i write and i've heard this before you hear all these things that write it take different ways but i think if you have the skeleton and then it fleshes out as it goes it goes in directions that you don't expect it to go and the characters become more rounded characters hopefully if you're making decent characters up which i think is something i generally can do and um, if you're making well-rounded characters they will show themselves to you and maybe perhaps in ways that you, you hadn't envisaged at first. But that's part of the interesting part, you know. If it was just getting from A to Z right straight through, it would be just typing, really, wouldn't it? Yeah. But, um, yeah, but and, you know, as a woman, it's like uh, every woman wants a Christian in, his, in her life. That's right. Like somebody that was going to do anything that they could and literally, I mean, risked his life over and over and over again for her. And... Yeah, she's got to be something else, right? She's, she's got to I'm trying else. to picture what she looks like, because, you know. <laughs> they count a Troy, they put my that, you know. Right, and I didn't know, so what I loved about this is I, I know pretty much about World War II. You know, I know pretty much, but this actually told a story that I did not know. I did mm. not know about the island of Jersey. Yeah. I did not know that... Um, that the Germans had, you know, I didn't know exactly what happened on that island. So how did you come across that story in your, you know, right. research? Uh, I'll tell you the story behind it, right? Okay. So there's a bit of a story behind the story. Okay, great. So uh, I moved to this country in 2008. Uh, I've been living with my American wife, who's from Philadelphia, where I live now, um, in Ireland for the previous four years, right? We've known each other since 
we met many years ago. 20 years ago we met now, right? We went nine ninety seven. So uh, we've been living in Ireland since 2004, 2008, and she said, come on over to the States. We'll live with my parents for a few weeks. Then we'll, you can, we'll move out and get jobs. I was like, I didn't want to go. So, but she dragged me over, you know, kicking the screen. <laughs> and um, we moved into her parents' house. Uh-huh. Now, don't get me wrong, her parents are lovely people, very kind, very obliging. But we stayed and ended up living there for 18 months because we moved over and there was a little bit of a... A little bit of a, a little bit of a, uh, unfortunate happening with the economy at the time. I don't remember if you remember September two thousand eight. Might not have been the best time to be looking for a job, particularly in the in the mortgage and banking in industry. The, right in the finance. Which industry. I was working in at the time. Right. So I think if I lived to be about one hundred and fifty, I I don't think I could actually find a worse time to move to America than than at that stage. So uh, we were unemployed for a long time. Now I'd written before. I, I'd started writing my first book when I was like 21, maybe to impress girls or whatever, you know. Um, it works, it works sometimes. <laughs> um, and uh, I started, I had written another couple of things and I knew I would write again and I just, it was just right out of time now, so let's start writing another book. And I did and finally a record was the result of that. Uh, now, how I came up with the idea for Jersey, you were asking. Um, so, Every night in my in-laws' house, right, so they have their couch downstairs in the basement where they watch TV, and, and then, so the, the dad, great guy, lovely, really easy guy, cool guy, sits on the end, reading his paper, doing his puzzles, and calf watching the TV. So then my wife would sit here near him, and then my mother-in-law, who's a lovely person again, would be sitting on the couch. And there wasn't really enough room for me unless I wanted to sit like this with my mother-in-law, which, you know, I didn't want to. So I would sit on the end in my own little seat, and there was this little fold-up metal chair that I would sit on on the end, because they had no more than nice chairs. So I would get the crappy one, and I'd be sitting there in a metal chair, and then I'd have this desk, this rickety old desk in front of me, and I had my computer. And my best friend was a guy called Netflix. Uh, you may, you may be familiar. He was my first and probably best American friend that I made. Oh, that's funny. Uh, um, so I sit, I sat down. I was watching a, I think they started a documentary called Auschwitz Inside the Nazi State, which is still on on um, Netflix. Yeah, I was watching. You know, it's fun. They were, they were literally watching like Wheel of Fortune, and I was watching Auschwitz wow. Inside the Nazi State at the end of the table. But um, uh, and there was a bit in it about Jersey, and I've never really known much about Jersey. Apart from it's a nice, it's a nice place to go. It's a tax haven. It's a little, it's a little um little island you go to in the summer to go to the beach and I saw there was a, something on there about a, a girl a young girl in her early to mid 20s who was taken away from Jersey by the Nazis and sent over to a concentration camp it wasn't Auschwitz actually but it was I think she did survive the war I remember but anyway so they had a picture of her and, and, and it imagined her on the boat leaving Jersey and the boat so the picture was the camera was on the boat leaving the harbour of Jersey and I was thinking, imagine if she was on the boat, and imagine if there was a guy left there who was like, oh my God, my girl's been taken away. What would he do to get her back? And that's where the idea of finding a record came from initially. Wow. So, and then it all, you know, it all springs from there. That's you make awesome. Stuff. I, you know, I read, a, I read a lot of books, okay? A lot of books. I, I can't even tell you how many a week. But when I was reading this, I was like, oh my God, now this is a writer. Like, I read every word you wrote. Like, you know, a lot of times I'm trying to read, you know, to see if I want to interview an author and I'll just, you know, skim through a book. I read every paragraph, every sentence, every word. And that's how I knew. I was like, wow, he can write. Like, it, the story just, it got me right from the beginning. And what I love, and I will show everybody this, first of all, for those of us who don't know the ranks in Germany... Yeah, I, yeah, I wrote that out myself. Actually, that I, I, yeah, that was very helpful. When once he got to the concentration camp and was, you know, and I kept referring back to this to find out if you know what rank these people were because I did, I did not know. But then you also put on here exactly where Jersey is, which was also yeah. very helpful because I had no idea. So I really enjoyed that part. Oh, Mostly stones. Yeah, that's obviously where New Jersey is. Is there? That's old Jersey. New Jersey is there. New Jersey. That's what I was thinking. That's yeah. what I was thinking. And I called the guy Christian, Christian, and his name is Christopher. But okay, yeah. this is this is what I love that you did. So right from the beginning, 
you know, I'm, I'm, you're figuring out that they're going to be a, the love interest. And um, her name's Rebecca. She's Jewish. Mm -hmm. You picked a very Jewish name for her. And then Christopher is very not Jewish. And it was yes. like, it was, it, to me, that's what I always look for when I read books is like different things like that, that just draw me into the story of, you know, and I was like, he did that on purpose, right? You did that. I mean, very much. Yeah. Yeah. Very much. Yeah. So, um, and just the way that they're, like I said, the way that he, cause you're writing it from his perspective, mm, right? I saw the whole book. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so did you find yourself like, is there a lot of you in him? I wish. <laughs> he's completely great. He's awesome. <laughs> yeah, he's so brave. I can't believe it. Oh, um, is there a lot of me and him? I don't know. Maybe for a moral sense. I'd like to think of myself as a very upstanding moral person. But apart from that, I'm not as brave as he is. Man alive. I wouldn't be doing that stuff. He, I mean, he... Did, he would have done anything. And, and that's what I loved about it. It was like when he made that decision and it kind of, you know, jumped to, oh my gosh, he is working at that concentration camp just to be able to save her life and what he had to do to convince them that he believed in what they and what they were doing and but then what he was able what he was able to do I was telling my daughter about it actually and I was like it was so cute and then he saved children and then he did that and she's like is this a real guy I'm like no it's not a real guy uh, there were stories that there were there's there's similarities and stories um of things that happened actually did, I, I I did a lot of historical research as you can probably tell you did um, I think the more you do the, I think if, you, if it's worth doing two hours of historical research to get one line, it just makes it all more authentic, you know? Yes. Um, and there was a guy I based Christopher's position in Canada, in, in Auschwitz, on mm -hmm. obviously an accountant, and his name was Oscar uh, Groening. Uh, same spelling as the creator of The Simpsons, Matt Groening. Um, but um, he was... So I, I saw an interview with him in, in that same documentary, and I looked him up, and... Um, there's a lot of stuff online about him. And he, he said, I was there, and he challenged the Holocaust deniers, and deniers a lot. And actually, he was arrested about two or three years ago. After it finally came out, he was arrested. And, um, yeah, he was put on trial for his part in um, running Auschwitz. Now, he, his, his argument was, like, I never killed anyone. I was there as an accountant, and I don't deny it, and I was there. I actually can't really remember what happened to him. I should look it up. But I did know Anton, but I kind of forgot. But yeah, he was on trial actually since Oscar Graining, yeah. Interesting. That's what I was wondering when I was reading it. I was like, do you think that there were people like him there? Who worked in camps? Oh, yeah. Oh, like, it was a whole, this whole community there. I, one thing I was initially going to touch upon in the camps, I thought this was very interesting, was there was um, the things in the camps, like there was a fire brigade in the camps. Um, there was... There were very likely um, prostitutes who worked in the camp, a uh, brothel for the guards. Again, it's mentioned that there was uh, movie theaters for the guards. There was like plays that were put on. It was like a, a small town. Um, several thousand guards went through there, and obviously um, over a million uh, inmates were murdered there. But as well, like so, so um, Auschwitz was, was divided into three. So there was Auschwitz one, which was the original camp, which was set up in the early, uh, late 30s, early 40s, which had previously been a, um, a Polish army camp. It's all coming back to me now. And um, then Auschwitz II was the death camp. That was uh, Birkenau, where my book is set, which is just for murdering people. And people were housed there, but more for temporary labor to be murdered. And then Auschwitz III was um, a labor camp, massive labor camp, where... Uh, a lot of companies set up where companies like Krupp, you know, they make kettles and metal goods and stuff. They were in Auschwitz III. There's a lot of German companies to this day who use slave, la slave Holocaust labor who are still hanging around. Hmm. So, but I mean, do you think that there were guards? Well, he wasn't a guard, but there were workers like him who they had to pretend. Like, do you think that that it really did disgust them and they didn't want? You know, like he was so self-aware like he didn't buy into it and, and but do, 
you know, some of them were forced, obviously. I mean, yeah, I, 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 I think 98% of them were just going along with it and saying, I'm getting my way and keeping my head down here and doing what I'm doing. Um, the SS did, did um, specifically um, get people who, who were like crazy killers. That they got them in to do these jobs. Um, so that they were particularly enrolled in that. Were there people like him? It's, it's impossible to say. I hope so. I, there was a there was a doctor I know in Auschwitz who was who, there, he was put on trial afterwards. He was the only person in the Nuremberg trials afterwards who was found not guilty. And he was, um, you know, have you heard of Doctor Mengele? He was an Auschwitz doctor. Uh, he, he actually was one of the few Nazis who actually got away. But um, he was an assistant to Doctor Mengele, and he specifically. So when he was meant to be like injecting twins and stuff and doing all these various experiments, he, he would he would literally put water in the uh, in the um, to inject them with in the uh, syringe. So he he pretended he was doing uh, these horrible experiments, where in fact he wasn't. So he was doing it specifically to protect the actual um, patients or the uh, inmates that he was meant to be experimenting on. So I suppose there are cases of that, you know. Um, but it's, I kind of stick them all together, you know. I, the, Christopher is meant to be an outsider, so we're meant to be able to see the camp through his eyes. And Christopher, it, it would be impossible to write a story like this from someone who was seeing the camp as okay, and I'm just trying to get this girl out. Because you would hate him, and why wouldn't you? Because he'd be utterly reprehensible. So as a main character, we have to be able to root for him, don't we? So he uh, had to be an outsider like us, looking in on us like we were. That was his role. Right. And I love how that, okay, so when he thought that he had lost Rebecca when, when he was told that she died and, and he gave up, you know, finding, trying to find her. And then his dad was like, well, you got to find something, you know? So it was like he was there and he just had to find something that he had to do, you know, because he was like, I'm not going to just be here and not be able to help in some way. And, you know, and especially for what his job was. And that's what I was thinking about. I was like, do you think there were some there that had some compassion that they were, you know, more more than one like hopefully but you know okay well what you brought up in the one part was that um the men running the gas chambers uh -huh. they circulated because they couldn't handle didn't didn't they circulate like every couple of weeks or something because they actually couldn't handle doing it or they they uh are you talking about the action the, the ss guards yeah, or the, like, the well the people whoever turned the gas on or i don't know yeah. you described at one point that there were these uh, I don't know if they're guards, whatever, workers at the gas chambers, but that they would circulate them because that they couldn't take it doing okay. it as often. You know, like uh, yeah, well, Michelle, this is what you get. I'm talking about a book you wrote five years ago. <laughs> well, for, well, it wasn't published five years ago, but, you know. No, it wasn't. No, but these things take a while. Uh, well, anyway, you did mention that, yeah. and I was like, well, maybe, you know, so, so it gave them a little bit, like, then you're thinking, okay, so it wasn't cool with them to be running, you know, killing how many people a day, you know, and and lying to these people yeah. and telling them they were going to give them baths and showers and, you know. Yeah. <laughs> That was one thing I found interesting that I put into the book, which, which you don't see in, in movies and stuff. You just see them, you know, her thing, get in there, and, you know, that. But it was actually the power of lies. That's what the Nazis used. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, I'll just go in, you're going to have a shower, and then afterwards you're going to get a meal, and then you're going to be working, and you're going to, we're all together. Why would we kill you? That's ridiculous. And that's what they did, and that's how the people walked in. They didn't, like, they weren't pushed in, like, at the end of a gun, they, were, they walked in. Right, because so, that's what they believed that they were just well. And how about the one um, at the end, the the one train that the the Jews paid for? They thought they were going to Switzerland. Switzerland, that's true story, actually. Yeah, like they actually paid to get on the train that they were told that was an escape, and they end up at Auschwitz. You know. Yes, that actually happened. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And most stuff, so, most of the stories in there, the little things, are adaptations of. Um, eyewitness accounts. Hmm. So I read a couple of eyewitness books and just changed things around here and there and, you know, put this put this good here, put that bit there and just wanted to remain as accurate as I could in that way. Right. So pretty strict of myself using only eyewitness books. No, no, nothing actually fiction or anything like that. Well, I think... Yeah, I, you know, let me just tell you, I mean, you can write, okay. <laughs> you are... 
<laughs> you are a, a fantastic writer, and even so just reading trying, the parts I'm, of the box. I'm like, trying to get my prose better. I just, I, I, I just, I'm in the middle of selling a book at the moment. I got knocked there on Thursday for a new novel, and I think the prose is very better personally in this book than this is finding a record. What What is the book called? It's called uh, White Rose Black Forest. Mm-hmm. So that's what we're. That's what we get to look forward to. Uh-huh. Black Forest is in Black Forest in Southwest Germany. Yes. So. Yes. So, okay, when you were when you were writing this, you got a publisher. A lot of people do self-publish. Did uh-huh. you did you look for this publisher? Like did you have to sell it to them and they they are the ones that It was a bit of an unusual thing. I am um, I started writing and looking for publishers in about nineteen ninety nine or so. Mm-hmm. And I got for various books I had, I had about, you know, the usual story, about 150. I used to keep my uh, my rejections and pin them to the wall, actually, and then that just got depressing. Cause, <laughs> because, the, because the thumbtack wasn't strong enough to hold up all the paper. You know? <laughs> like falling down, I was like, no, we're not doing this anymore. So, um, yeah, I got hundreds of rejections. Wow. And just kept on at it. And then when I first... Published finding a record. I did self publish it back in November 2012. Mm-hmm. And then it took a little while, actually, it didn't take a while, I think it took about six weeks to get going. And then um, I worked really hard. I was obsessed by marketing, I was obsessed. I still am a little bit. Um, although I have put the Fox Boys in paperback, so I'm obviously not that obsessed anymore. <laughs> but, um, there, there goes that argument. Then. But. Um, uh, it started doing well, and um, I got into like the top ten overall on Amazon. I did a, I did one of those um, promotions, and I got to number eight, so like X thousand books and all this, and did really well. And then it came. It, it I I came to the I found an agent. So then I worked with my agent, and we got it together, and we brushed it up, and it became better and better. And we you know, and then we sent it off to all the big big five publishers like you know the Hodders and all them and the and the Hachats and the um the Simon Schuster's of this world and uh they didn't want it and I was, I was disappointed obviously so that was from that was from about December 2013 until about April 2014 and then I got an email myself from Amazon Publishing uh, from their acquisitions editor there, who I just met actually on Friday for the first time. I had a lovely lunch with her in downtown Philly. We had a great time together. Um, a very charming woman by the name of Jody Warshaw. Uh, she emailed me and said she'd find it, she'd read Finding Rebecca and she loved us. And and it just went from there. It was really easy from there. They just wanted us and they, you know, they published it for me and it came out in October 2014. And it's been very consistent for me ever since. Did they publish Bogside Boys also? No, they didn't want us. I, I showed Broadside Boys and they didn't want it. Uh, it didn't fit in with their, you know, the type of books that they published. With. Actually, so. okay, so I didn't really know that they could do that. I, did, I thought once they had you as an author, that no matter what you did, basically, that they no. could actually reject. It depends on your contract. Like, it's, it's, it's a certain contract seems like a three book deal or whatever. If I had, they would have worked with that and published to get it the way they wanted it. But with these guys, um, yeah, it, it's kind of on a book by book basis. Like even with my book that I that I'm just in the process of selling to them, and I, I got an offer on Thursday. I just have to get through the final paperwork now. It's it is on a book by book basis. It's not like oh, listen, this is five book deal. We want the next four books after this or whatever. It's just okay. We'll take this one, and it's going to come out next year. Then and then we'll see what you have for us. But, um, Interesting, because it's so much like. I mean, since it is historical fiction again, it I you know. I would think that that would be, it would be, it's not like it's a complete uh, difference. It, I think for them it was a bit too much set in the time and place. Mm. Um, and the time and place obviously being 1970s and 80s and Derry in Northern Ireland. Um, I can see now why they didn't want to publish it myself. And to be honest, I have no problem with that. I, I, I wrote, they asked me did I want to change it to pursue them. And I was like, no, I wrote, I've written the book that I want to write and that's it. So and that's, that's it. That's all you can do. I mean, okay, so the fact that even for this book to be, you know, like you put it out there and then people start, then they're like, oh, so I guess it helps like to get it out there. Then you get a publishing company and then what? what is the benefit like for you to 
the difference because I hear both sides. Like there are a lot of people that are like, I'm only going to sell money. I mean, do they really? But does it how I mean, yeah. It, yeah. it did. It helped it, if the book's going to sell really well on its own as a self-published book, OK, great. And then you do hear stories about that. Mainly you need volume for that. The, the most the most successful um, the most successful uh, self published writers generally have like ten, twelve, or twelve books out there. So they they just you know keep on chugging away. Um, with the the publisher can it's it's just got a much farther reach. Uh, they can they can uh, promote you in a much much more effective manner. And well, uh, can people find this book at Barnes and Noble? No, they can't. No, no. Um, I'm uh, I, I'm published by Lake Union, who are part of Amazon Publishing. Who they've got the best, the, they've got the best business model ever. So they so they work operate within the world's largest bookshop and promote themselves and put them up, up front in the world's largest bookshop, and they don't need the other costs associated with sending it to Barnes and Noble. It, well, it's, you know what? It's, I heard a little secret. I was a uh... I was interviewing somebody, uh, she was a publisher, okay? So it was kind of interesting because I got to have her take on what the publishing business can do for people. And um, she was like, Barnes & Noble is history in the next five years because she dealt with them all the time and supposedly they're very not easy to deal with because they have their own, they have a, a, like she said that she would sell books to them and then like two weeks later they'd toss them right back and they have this like humongous, like if it doesn't sell within two weeks, they send them right back and so yeah. she was like very anti Barnes and Noble. So. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it was interesting to hear her take on. I mean, because she was a publisher and she had to do, you know, she had to do that work for her clients, and that's what she does. She actually only publishes women authors, which was kind of interesting. But anyway, you know, I if I put on a wig and said like my book, would yeah, you? really. If you like, if you did what J.K. Rowling did and like, you know, just put initials and be like, it, it's a woman, you know. But yeah. Anyway, it was just a really interesting take because she does believe that Amazon is, you know, that that their publishing is the top notch way to go, and. Right. So, you know, she has a lot of success with them. And they certainly believe themselves that they are the future. You know, they're, they're very convinced by their own uh, rhetoric in that in that manner. Uh, hey, I've had very pleasant experiences. And I have to say, they're lovely people and they're really good to work with. They're very. Well, they look it's good to hear. I like you know, I like getting everybody's take on it because I think it helps also new authors who are out there know what you know, that's which I'm really interested in helping is people who are out there writing their first book and sure. you know, wanting to know what to do. But, which is another question, how long did it take you to write this? Oh, I've been asked that question so many times and the answer is I don't really know. It's, it's, it depends, it depends what you mean by having written it, you know? Well, like, do you <laughs> look at a book a year or do you look at, like, how do you, when you're planning your books you know like do you look well, at like well if i can write it in a year then i've got a book a year and also it's, i'm at the stage now where i've been doing it for a while and it's like doing anything you just get better as you get as you get go along and i have much less wasted time now okay the best example i can give you of how i am now is obviously my last book so i started that on like february 26th last year or something like that late february last year so almost a year ago and i had the first draft finished by I wanted to get it finished by the end of school break for summer, which is about June 10th. So it took me about three and a half to four months to finish the first draft. Then it kind of sits around for a while. They hand it to your agent. It comes back. The editing process. Mm -hmm. There's a lot less work in that, but it's it's a lot it's a lot more time because the great thing about the first draft for me as a writer is I know I can okay I'm going to go along to the library this Sunday and I'm going to be there for four hours and I'm going to get two and a half thousand words done and I will and I always do. And then I'm going to go on Tuesday and I'm going to get a thousand words done. And I always do. And I'm going to go on Thursday and I'll get a thousand words done. I always do. So I can, I know I can just did, 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 write the book and complete it under my control. But then you start giving to other people. That's when, oh, I'm going to give to this editor and he's going to take like six weeks. And then three weeks later, it's, oh, I couldn't get to it. I'll get to it in two weeks' time. And then it's, you know, so it takes a while. So then, again, cutting a long, boring story short, hopefully not too boring. And we sent it to my publisher on December 21st. So getting it from starting the novel on late February to sending it to the publisher on December 21st. So then the publisher has to get it, the editor has to read it, and they made an offer on it on Thursday. 
So that was what? February the what, 9th or something? So it's it's like a year. Yeah, yeah. And then it'll be another year before it's published. Like they gave me a publishing date of January 23rd, 2018. Okay, yeah, so yeah. they say they want to publish it and then they, it takes them a whole another year to get it out. Yeah, that's pretty... Um, Even if you're going on Kindle machine. Unlimited? What about if you put it out on Kindle Unlimited? Well, yeah, they could do that, but no, they're not going to do that. <laughs> it's just a matter of... It's just a matter <laughs> of... Um, you are so funny. <laughs> they put space on the docket, you know? It's just like they only have X amount of books they're going to put out in any one year. And she was telling me that uh, they're actually already over by one for 2017. So when I... When it's I, just baffling to me. I'm just like, really... Like, you know, yeah, they have all these marketing schemes and all this. They have all these marketing plans, and they are very precise about this. Like Amazon don't mess around, as you know, um, and uh, they are going to take over the world, <laughs> and I'm going to be one of them. I'm, I'm in the inside. Um, so, so but, is is your goal to be able to quit your day job and do this oh, full time? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Because it seems to me, if it's going to take that long, like. You need to be writing way more. Like you need to Yeah, I'm gonna start with you book in about three weeks. <laughs> and then we'll start the next book, yeah. Right. And then, you know, if I can start a new book and this time next year we at this stage again and then this time next year, then I should be going. I like teaching at school, but I absolutely adore I love writing. Love it. I I do enjoy teaching, but it's not non writing for me. It's great. Really? It it that it, yeah, like, at about like nine in the morning too, but that'd be awesome. <laughs> Do you, uh, what grades do you teach? Are you a high school teacher? Through, pay through eight. Okay, oh, through So today uh, I had started off with six grades, they're 12, and then I had kindergarten, who were five, and then I had first grade, and then I had second grade, they're seven, and then I had first grade, who were six. Nice. That was my day. Nice. Well, I mean, I hope you can write full time because I, you know, I'd like to see you get more, more books that, out there and, you know. So do I. We have that common, then definitely we do. We have that common. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't wait to talk to you about Bogside Boys, and I'm so happy that you have another one also in the works. Ooh, yeah, okay, yeah. so you already, so now that you found out that that one's published, like, where, where's your head now? Like, the next one? Uh, I'm thinking about, yeah, I have a couple of ideas. I came up with an idea in like a day last week, and I really like it. <laughs> it's my son. Um, I'm thinking about writing, hi! Hi, Robbie. Uh, I was thinking about writing a book um, about the gold rush in Klondike in the late 1800s. The, the biggest gold rush in the late in the 19th century was between about 1896 and 1899 in um, in the Yukon in Canada. And I want to write something around that. I really like that idea. That's awesome. I'm I'm so happy about that. Well, I will let. I guess we can. I'm excited about it. Yeah, we can. Let's, is he going to be on camera? Okay. Oh, hi. Hi there. Robbie. You are on camera. That's Michelle. She thinks I'm a great writer, Robbie. <laughs> so a fantastic writer. <laughs> nice to have fans. Like, you're my fan, but for different reasons. Aw, he's so adorable. Well, okay, thank you so much. Camera. Start poking the screen now. <laughs> thank you so much, and I will be in touch with you to do the Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, no, it was a real pleasure talking to you. I it enjoyed was. It. it was a lot of fun, and everybody here again is... Finding Rebecca. First of all, I love that. Did you pick this out or did your publisher? The cover? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, so, when you're the author, you, the great thing about being the author is you're a boss at all times. So, you're the boss of your own little corporation. So, they they got a really good cover designer for me. It's quite expensive to make that up. So, uh, he wants to be there. He's that's going. okay. We'll let you go. But it's a no, no, that's fine. It's fine. You can do it. I mean, that's, that's and, a beautiful um, cover. Look at that. He. Uh, so they give you various, they give you various covers to choose from, and I I like that one the best. I picked that one out, but then they some of the pictures on it were wrong and blah blah blah. So I just say change that little picture, blah blah blah. I want this color. So you you get to choose most of yourself. Oh, it's awesome! It's great. So and I and I wrote the blurb on the back, and the oh, picture to do me in there is from me, and yeah. picture me back where I look oh, like yeah. I'm not saying I'm like this. It's it's a beautiful book. So um, they did a great job. Awesome. Yeah, I was happy with it. Yeah, so yes. yeah, I'm looking forward to the next one coming out next year, which is also World War II, um, set in Germany during the war itself. Oh, that should be awesome. Which I I'm very confident that's better than funny, right? Very confident. Well, work on the Bogside Boys cover, getting it 
in print. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You should do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're kind of getting that in print, but in the meantime, because I was, because sometimes if somebody has it on Kindle, they're like, oh no, I have the printed right here, you know, like they have, but you're like, no, I don't have, I don't even have one. <laughs> You've yeah, no, it's definitely, I'll get that though, yeah, I'll get that though. The thing is, it's only taking half an hour. I just haven't got, so. Oh, that's, that's a, that's it's a good thing. It's just like, I just have to upload it and blah, blah, blah. I just didn't have all the stuff with me. Yeah. Yeah, I'll get to it. Okay, awesome. Michelle, this is, you have happened. When you see it in, in print, you'll go, that was me. I, I made him do that. That's right. That's, <laughs> that's right. Well, you have a great night and we will be in touch. Okay. Thanks, Thank you, Michelle. Owen. Great talking. It was great. It was great fun. Thank you. All right, bye-bye now. Okay, bye-bye.